All right. How is everybody this morning? Good, good. A lot of, a lot of folks here we haven't seen in a while, which is very encouraging to me. Um, all of our teachers are here. Those classes are going on, and it's been uh, probably three Sundays since we've been able to have everything kind of go as normal. Um, so praise the Lord for that. Um, obviously, the Davis family is uh, going to be traveling today to North Carolina. For those who don't know, they have their fancy new Honda Pilot. And new, it's just like when I buy something new, it still has 150,000 miles on it, but it's new to them. Um, it is not <laughs> brand new by any stretch of the imagination. So at any time, you know, when you buy something new, sometimes you've got some bugs to work out of it. So please pray that, uh, that they don't find any bugs while they're traveling. That's never what you want. Um, from what I understand, the funeral went as well as a funeral can go yesterday. Um, and they are traveling uh, to North Carolina today. Um, and uh, Frank will be doing the graveside service tomorrow. So keep them in your prayers. Um, any other praises or prayer requests to talk about this morning? Justin, who is back? And it looks like you've lost even more of more of more weight. Glad to have you back, Justin. Anybody else this morning? Don't all jump up at once. All right. Ron. Still making progress, and you sound like you were feeling much better. Even on Tuesday, you were not in nearly as good a shape as you are this morning, so yeah, praise the Lord. It's, it's a gaining process. The Lord is good. Amen. Amen. All right. John. Right on. You sold. That means you sold out, right? Kind of in a roundabout way, like you sold out of the first. Yeah. Yeah, for those watching via the Internet, just hop the plane down to Pensacola, go over to the Bodacious Bookstore, I look for the John Irvin series. He's got one or two there, right? Three. He's got three. So you're going to need probably a box or a suitcase to bring them home with you. Anybody else this morning? All right, with that, let's go to the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father God, as we come before you this morning, Lord, we just want to praise your name, Father. Um, we've talked about it uh, a little bit amongst ourselves, but Lord, we want to praise your name that we have a building to be in this morning. We have lights, we have heat, we have air conditioning, we have an internet that we can send your word out forth, Father God. We all got here in cars that are not falling apart um, for the most part, and Father, we want to praise your name for that. Lord, we ask that you'll continue to bless us. Father God, we ask that you'll be with Pastor Davis and Miss Debbie and the Caldwell family and the Whitaker family, Father, as they have lost someone very near and dear to them, and Lord. Uh, we think about the impact that Dr. Lucas has had, uh, not just there in Tennessee, but, Father, the impact he's had here in Florida and the impact he had even before that in Virginia. And, Father, we want to ask uh, that as his faith has now become sight, that he can look and see you face to face. We want to ask that you would help as we grieve here on earth for us to remember that, that you would help us to um, use that as an opportunity, Father, that even in his death we might lead someone to Christ through him. And Father, we just ask that you would be with us now this morning. Heavenly Father God, please get me out of your way. Please communicate your word to your people. And we pray. Amen. So, you're all probably wondering, what are we going to talk about this morning? Last week, we finished the book of Acts, and it took us uh, almost an entire year to go through the book of Acts. And when we started in my mind, I said, you know what, people might not hang on to a book for a whole year. They might get bored. So I had built in a bailout point. If things weren't going well, if people hated the book of Acts, I was going to stop before Paul's missionary journey. And I was just going to say, we talked about the early church. That's good enough. Let's move on. Um, but you all hung in there with me and I appreciate that. And we were able to finish the book of Acts. And as we finish the book of Acts, I hope that you have a greater understanding understanding of the first church, a greater understanding of what they did and taught and how they continued to do and teach the same thing that Jesus continued to do and teach. And as we this morning here in Cross and Crown in 2020 and soon to be 2021, we're going to do that same thing. We're going to continue what Jesus started. So I thought as we finished the book, talking about the beginning of the book, because the end of the book really didn't have a whole lot for us. It's not a great wrapped up beautiful conclusion. It says Paul continued to teach. And that's basically the end of the book of Acts, as we must continue then to teach. So I thought as we're here this morning, continuing to do what Jesus did and taught, maybe we should look at what Jesus did and taught. 
So if you would, turn to the book of Matthew. We're going to work our way through Matthew chapter 1. And this time I had enough confidence that I didn't build in a bailout point. But if at any point you're bored and you can't take any more Matthew, I will not be offended if you say, can we do something else, please? I really won't be offended. But I hope that as we went through the book of Acts, we can go through the book of Matthew and again, just develop an understanding of what's going on in God's word. Um, so as we begin, when we begin a book, let's consider who wrote it and to whom they wrote it. And what were they trying to convey by writing it? And then after we know who wrote it, who they were writing it to, and what they wanted to tell those people, what are we supposed to be learning this morning here in 2020 and soon to be 2021? Who wrote this book? This book was written, as you're all probably familiar with, Matthew, the tax collector, the publican. Matthew does not claim authorship of this book himself, and all through the book he talks about himself in the third person. When we consider authors of the Bible, we would see um, one thing that I think we can say uh, unilaterally about the authors of the Bible. Um, they did not spend inordinate amounts of time talking about themselves. Um, they didn't talk about how awesome they were or the things they did. They spent their time focusing on Christ. Many of the authors are men who would not have much to boast in anyhow when we think about it. Fishermen, rough men, publicans. We know Paul held the equivalent of three doctorates and Luke was an MD, um, but they were still humble men. And this proves to me how amazing God is that he can use a fisherman, he can use a publican, or he can use a guy who's got the equivalent of three doctorates. Are you a rocket surgeon this morning? And yes, I said that on purpose. God can use you. Are you a lawyer? God can use you. Are you a tax collector? God can use you. Are a mechanic? Are you a mechanic, a carpenter, a customer service agent, a salesman, a nurse? No matter who you are, God this morning can use you if you're willing to be used. It's interesting. We know when we talk about the Apostle Paul that Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Um, he was born the eighth day, and he can go through all of his pedigree and why he was awesome. And when you think of a Pharisee, I don't know about you, but the one word that I would think of to describe a Pharisee is arrogant. Look at me, I'm better than you. That's what I think of when I think of the Pharisee. And Paul said, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there was given me a messenger of Satan to buffet me in the flesh. I think as a Pharisee, Paul probably tended towards arrogancy. His entire life, he was kept away from everybody else, and he went to those schools, and he was a Pharisee. And as a Pharisee, he was the most zealous Pharisee that there was. And I think Paul probably looked at even all the other Pharisees and said, you think you're a Pharisee? I'm even a better Pharisee than you are. Um, and because of that, God allowed Satan to hit Paul where flesh and bone come close together. The idea of Buffett is not just a hit. It's a hit where flesh and bone come close together. And somewhere I had a, a class on the proper use of the retractable baton. And this, in short, the way to use a baton, or a stick in this case, is you just want to use it on anything where bone and skin are close together. So an elbow, a knee, um, joints basically are the idea. And you can really stop somebody very, very effectively with just a little bit of force applied where bone and skin come together. It's my theory based on this. Then when Paul was stoned to death, God gave him an issue, a broken knee joint or maybe a broken elbow, possibly a broken collarbone or shoulder, and that for the rest of Paul's ministry, most people believe it was his eyes, but I could show you why I think it's not that. But for the rest of Paul's ministry, Paul would go about teaching and Paul would go about preaching. And I'll bet there was a time or two when Paul tells us, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, lest I should think that I'm super cool because God told me all this stuff. God allowed Satan to hit me where flesh and bone are close together. And I think that Paul likely, because of that broken joint that he had, probably had a very, very bad case of arthritis. And that any time Paul started thinking, I can do this, I'm awesome, that that arthritis would flare up and Paul would wince and say, you're right, Lord, I can't do it. And it was just a constant reminder of how even though he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, even though he had three doctorates, that Paul couldn't do it, that Paul had to stay humble. Unfortunately, it would seem in some circles that humility and meekness are confused for being effeminate, for being soft and sissy-like. But in order to be humble, there has to be something in your life that you could be proud of. There has to be something in your life that you could boast of. If there's nothing you can boast of, then how can you be humble? It's the same thing. Meekness is power under control. And if you have no power to put under control, then how can you be meek? If you have no power to put under control, then all you are is weak. So humility is important. And I think it's something that we see in the apostles, but we don't see it right in the beginning of the apostles. 
When we see it in the apostles, we see it's something that they have to learn. Think about James and John's, the, the bow energies, the sons of thunder. They wanted to call down fire and they wanted to kill people. And Jesus said, no, that's not what we're here for. Let's, let's not just rashly call down fire from heaven. They were, had to learn humility. They had to learn to keep that power that they now had from God under control. You know, if I could say this, um, and it may seem a little bit silly, and maybe you can think of something in your life that is the same. Um, there are so many things in Scripture that are like shooting. Shooting is a perishable skill, and again, maybe you can think of a perishable skill in your life. If I don't get trigger time, I get slow, I get sloppy, and I'm not nearly as effective. If you're humble today and not tomorrow, you will lose that level of humility. If you control your emotions today and you take every thought captive today and you don't next week, you will lose that ground that you've gained. If you're the very definition of forgiveness and someone spits in your face and you just wipe it off and forgive them, but the next day uh, they do the same thing and you punch them in the mouth, you've lost the ground that you've gained. Many things are like that. Take bodybuilding, for instance. When I was in high school, I used to love to pick up heavy things and put them down. And I would occasionally grab the bumper of someone's car and see if I could get the, the rear end of the car off the ground, like I saw one of the strong men do uh, on TV, Yoko Ahola. Um, and unfortunately, I never did get a car off the ground. But if I took a month off, um, and I got lazy, and it was wild because all of that muscle I had built would rapidly turn to fat. The same thing is true in the Christian life. Um, if you slack for a day, then you begin to lose what you've earned. Pastor Davis even talked about this in relation to the crowns that we can earn in heaven. It's possible that we can earn a crown and that if we don't maintain that crown, we'll lose it. So please don't slack this morning. When do we slack the most? I don't know about you, but I tend to develop routines. Uh, when you have a routine, uh, it's, it frees up your brain to do creative things while you're doing the mundane thing. For me, like I do a lot of break jobs, so I have developed a routine. It doesn't matter what the car is. I do the exact same steps and the exact same order every time. So I don't have to think about the break job. It's just something I can put on autopilot. So then while I'm doing that break job, I can think about any number of things. I can be listening to a sermon and really listen to it because my hands are doing what they've done a million times. And I'm sure there are things in your life that you do this way. Honestly, many of us, even though we don't realize it, we drive our car on autopilot. The car is doing the thing that it's supposed to do, and that's become a subconscious process. We're doing it so long, so then we can text while we're driving, even though then something happens and we have to interrupt our autopilot because there's now a child in front of us or whatever it is. So, but many things we've relegated to that level. We've done them so many times. It's a subconscious process for us. But... When do I slack the most? It's when I break my routine. When do I break my routine the most? Holidays. And we're in the midst of holiday season. And breaking your routine, um, you can break your routine of life. Obviously, you want a day off from work. You want a day off. But don't break your routines of godliness. Because when you pick them back up, you won't be in the same place. You'll be behind where you were. I think there is hope because even now when I have slacked and I haven't been shooting and training very well, I can pick up much quicker where I was. And when I was lifting weights, when it turned to fat, I could turn that fat back into muscle much quicker. So if you have been slacking this morning, I think there is hope. You can get back to where you were faster than that progress it took you to get there. But please don't slack. I have written in my notes the following. Yeah, even I will admit that was a rabbit trail, but character traits are so important. And the character of humility is definitely seen in the authors of the Bible. See, we took the next exit and now we're back on track. How then uh, do we know that Matthew wrote this? We, we said that we didn't know for sure. There's an early reliable uh, church tradition and early church historians have attributed this book to Matthew. What is a publican? During this time, uh, not this time here, this time in Matthew's day, uh, Rome rules the known world. And Rome would sell off the ability to tax certain areas. They would sell it off to a person known as a publicai. And that person, uh, the, these group of rich Romans, these publicai, would then bid on the ability to tax Syria or to tax uh, Judah or to tax whatever area that there was. And then they would win, 
um, when they bid, and then they would take that area and they would get as much taxes as they could possibly get out of that area. They had so many taxes. They had import taxes, export taxes, toll bridges, crop taxes, sales tax, property tax, special tax when there was a war to pay for the war, building or special tax to pay for a building project, or special tax to pay for a campaign to finance. Um, you could even be taxed. Now listen to this. This is really like, uh, this is unique. You could even be taxed per wheel per mile if you were pulling a cart down the road, and then per wheel as that same cart went over a bridge. And when we think of this, I have to ask myself, Adam, you would ask the same thing. How many times was somebody pulling a two-wheel cart and they had stacked way too much on there because they wanted 50% of that taxes and that cart just broke in half? Um, so the Romans sold off the rights to tax uh, the regions, and they sold them off to the highest bidder, and they came up with elaborate and utterly ridiculous methods of extracting those taxes out of the Jews that lived there. But how did they collect the money? They didn't do it themselves. They had the public eye, had a public can, a tax collector, someone who was Jewish who would collect those taxes, someone who understood the culture of the people, someone who knew how far they could push, how much they could steal, right up to the point where there would be a full-scale rebellion. And that's why they had somebody who was Jewish to do that. Matthew is that guy. He's the guy who's selling out his own people. He's the guy who's collecting taxes from them for a rich Roman who bought the rights to these taxes. Matthew is at best a traitor to the Jewish people, but worse than that, many did not simply make an hourly wage. He was not salary. He would charge extra to pay himself. So if the Roman man who had purchased the right uh, and they said, you know, if you want to sell your crops at market, will you have to pay me 1,500 denarii for the privilege of selling your own crops? Matthew would then just bump it up to 1,700 or 2,000. Some tax collectors were worse than others. If we remember the tiny situation of Zacchaeus who came up short, that was supposed to be hilarious. When it came to salvation, because he was, he was, <clears throat> we know after he was saved, he had to pay back the people that he had cheated four times. We do not see that from Matthew. So it's possible that Matthew as a tax collector was an honest tax collector, that he only uh, took a reasonable amount. He didn't take more than he should. And I'm talking about you, Scott Lunsford, charging me $500 for a 50-cent piece of stamped steel made by a prisoner. We've all been there, right? Um, why do I have to pay you to drive my car on the road? Is it not my car? I digress, but understand, this is how people felt about Matthew. When was it written? This is an even harder issue to nail down. Scholars cannot agree. There's about a, a 30 to 60 year window that they think maybe the book of Matthew was written. Um, they can't get an exact date, but they agree that it's written 400 years after Malachi. Think about this. This is something that, again, there are so many things in Scripture that we can say, but to really wrap our heads around them, I think, is very challenging, and this is one of them because we've never experienced it. For 400 years, God was silent. God did not communicate to man. The Holy Spirit had not yet come. Israel had failed to be the light they were supposed to be to the world, so for 400 years, God has not spoken through a prophet. So those 400 years were a dark time. But then we'll see John the Baptist come and say, make way, prepare you the way of the Lord. And we'll see Jesus, the Son of God, come to earth in the flesh. And that's where we pick up here in Matthew. That's where we come on the scene. They did have the law and the prophets, and there's no doubt that God could have spoken through the law and the prophets. He could have spoken through his word, but the problem was the people who were supposed to be communicating the word of God, communicating the law and the prophets to these people were the scribes and the Pharisees. And the scribes and the Pharisees, instead of telling them what God's word said, made up their own oral tradition and basically botched it. So you might have an idea what the scribes and Pharisees said, but the scribes and Pharisees didn't tell you what the Bible really said. They told you what they thought it said. They basically made it up as they went along. What is Matthew trying to convey to his Jewish audience this morning? He's trying to convince them that Jesus is the king. And if Jesus is the king, he's going to tell us how we should live in that kingdom. It's interesting to note the word kingdom occurs 50 times in this book. And of those 50 times, 32 of them, the phrase kingdom of heaven appears. In the other gospels, the words kingdom of heaven is not used. It's kingdom of God. But here the words kingdom of heaven are used so as not to offend the Jews immediately. He wants to be able to reach his audience. So he's calling it the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of God. 
Verse 1, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. To the Jewish mind, these two men are above all other men. Abraham, the founder of the faith. David, the king, the man after God's own heart. Then we have what we always dread reading in the Bible. We have the list of begats. Who begat whom? Why would you start your book this way, Matthew? When I was in school, they taught me to lead with an attention grabber. You want to get the audience's attention right off the bat. And for us, this is pretty rough stuff. But to the Jews, this was exciting. They all knew who they were from because you couldn't own land unless you knew which tribe you were from. Way back when God divided out the land, he divided it out by tribes. And when he divided it out by tribes, one tribe could not buy the land that God had given from another tribe. So if you were a man and you wanted to buy property, you had to know which tribe you were from in order to be able to buy that property. I wish America would have caught on to that simple idea and only let actual American citizens purchase land here, yet they've allowed Chinese and other countries to purchase land in America. Who thought that was a good idea? So you needed to know your tribe to own land. You also needed to be able to prove your heritage if you wanted to be a priest in the temple. And besides that, being able to brag about who your great-grandpa was was super important to these people. But Matthew is also in these verses proving how because Joseph is Jesus' legal father, not biological father, but legal father, how Jesus legally has a right to the throne which if he's going to say this guy had better be king, then he had better be able to trace that lineage and prove that he has a legal right to the throne of David. Though Joseph, through Joseph, Jesus has the right to reign legally as king. But in Luke, we see the bloodline of Mary traced back. And we see also that he has the blood to be able to be a king. And we'll see this morning here, if Joseph were his biological father, Jesus could not sit on the throne because of the curse of Jeconiah. But because Joseph is not his biological father, he is only a legal father, he can maintain the legal right passed down from him, but also have the blood through Mary to have the bloodline to bypass the curse of Jeconiah. And this allows Jesus both a legal and a blood right to the throne. If Matthew is going to say that Jesus is the king of the Jews, he would have to prove it to them. And that's why he begins with this here. He is beginning with the proof, and the proof is exciting to these people. The book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Now, as we read, you guys can laugh at my pronunciation of these names. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brethren, and Judah begat Pharisees, Pharisees, and Zara of Tamar, and Pharisees begat Isram, and Isram begat Aram, and Aram begat Abinadab, and Abinadab begat Nassim, and Nassim begat Solomon, and Solomon begat Boaz and Rah of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. And Solomon begat Robam, and Robam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa, and Asa begat Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Osias, and Osias begat Jotham, and Jotham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekias, and Ezekias begat Manassas, and Manassas begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time that they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought out of Babylon, Jeconias begat Sethiel, and Sethiel begat Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begat Abudu, and Abudu begat Elakim, and Elakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadok, and Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Iliad, and Iliad begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Methan, and Methan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph. Take a breath. The husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away of Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away of Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. As we look at that long list of names, can we pick out a few to talk about this morning? What does the family tree of Jesus look like? The purpose of giving this genealogy, we've said, is to establish that Jesus has a legal right to the throne. But Jews love genealogy. They're so proud of the names that are in their family tree. Most people are not at all familiar with their ancestry unless you have somebody potentially famous in your ancestry. And then you could say something like, I can say, did you know that I'm related to Samuel Clemens or Mark Twain? Not very much. Like two people stood in a room together. That's my relation. It's through my great-grandmother. Um, it practically doesn't count. But sometimes when there's somebody in your family like that, oh, do you know I'm related to? And people get really excited. Um, well, 
I also had some other folks in my family who went the other route, and it was pretty awkward for me. I lived in a small town where there were four or five elementary schools, and then just one junior high and one high school. So all through elementary school, everything seemed very normal to me, and uh, all through uh, junior high, it didn't seem to be much of an issue. But then when I went to high school, people would come up to me and say, hey, I'm your cousin. And be like, no, you're not. I don't know you. You're weird. Get away from me. And then I'd go home and tell my parents, and they'd be like, no, that's really your cousin. I'd be like, seriously? You guys kind of told me this? Um, so there was a, a whole uh, several people that I was related to that I didn't even know that were in my family tree. What kind of family tree does De Jesus, our Savior, have here? Well, Abraham, that's a good start. The father of the Jewish faith, um, the guy that we know for having faith, but we know that he also went into his wife's handmaid. We also know he told a lie about his wife. Who else? Jacob, the supplanter, the schemer. But he did get it right, and after wrestling with the Lord, God changed his name and began to call him Israel. Who else? Well, there's a woman named Tamar, and if you don't remember uh, the situation with Tamar, she decided to dress as a prostitute and then trick her father into having relations with her, and then she had a kid by her father. So incest and treachery and lying there. We see the name Ruth, and Ruth wasn't even a Jew. David, of course, we know didn't only lie, but he also committed adultery and committed murder to cover up his adultery. Did you see someone else in there? A name that when I say it, you're going to follow that name with two words as if it's her last name, Rahab the harlot. My favorite verse in our, all of our study in Acts was Acts 4.13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I put this verse on some of the Christmas cards to our missionaries, and I hope they understood what I was trying to communicate to them. These people in the family tree and the genealogy of Jesus, they're known for some pretty awful things. Lying, murder, adultery, incest. That's not what you want to brag about being in your family. But it's those people who, chose, who were chosen by God to have the lineage of his son. People who were messed up and people who were sinful. To be honest, when you think back of the time that you've spent in church, uh, when you think back especially of being a kid in church, I don't know about you, but when I think back, uh, I, I realize that something unique happens when you walk through the door of the church. When you walk through the door of the church on Sunday morning, suddenly you become absolutely sinless. A little halo pops over your head and you've never done anything wrong in your entire life. Forget that an hour ago you cursed at your life. Forget how Sunday night you were hammered. Forget what you were looking at on the internet. You walk through those doors and suddenly you're not sinful anymore. You haven't done things with your boyfriend or girlfriend you shouldn't have. Nope, there's no sin. You don't have an anger problem anymore. You're not bitter. You're not rebellious. It's all magically gone as you walk through the doors of the church house. It's insane when you think about it to think that we believe that of each other, that we're all somehow perfect. Um, that we must have it all together. How can we act like that when the most important names in the Bible, people we would say, look how God used this person or look what God did through that person, are sinful. David, a man after God's own heart, had eyes of lust from Satan. No, this morning we're all sinners. And if I can say this morning, the only halo any of us have this morning is a halo from the toilet seat on our bottom. We're all sinful and we all need grace and mercy and forgiveness from a, from a savior. And that's what we see in the genealogy of Jesus. We see the Bible as a book of sinners that Jesus, that God used. And please don't misunderstand me this morning, and this is so important. Please don't say, well, David committed adultery and murder. I'm no better than him. I guess I should go do that too. Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But some people use sin as an excuse. I'm too sinful for that. And it's true, the Bible has some qualifications for church offices, and our church has some qualifications if you're going to hold an office. And there are some things that you know you should do and you know you shouldn't do. But don't sit down and throw a pity party like you're the only one who's ever sinned. God never said, I can't use this person or I can't use that person. Look at Paul. Really consider Paul this morning. When I say, who is the most evil person you could think of, you'd probably say Hitler. I would say Paul. Hitler had a higher body count than Paul did, but it wasn't because Paul wasn't trying. Paul wrecked the church. He made havoc of the church. He destroyed the church. He would take men and women, drag them by their hair to Jerusalem with the goal of making them recant or to kill them. What did God choose to do with Paul? Well, he confronted Paul about his sin. He said, why are you persecuting me? Paul got saved. That's not where the story stopped. And I think so often when we see in Christendom today, somebody gets saved and that's where the story stops. No, Paul went through some training. Then Paul preached the gospel to the known world on foot. What's your excuse this morning? What's my excuse this morning? Who else is in the genealogy of Jesus? And I think this is important to consider Mary. 
If you're a Catholic this morning, forgive me, and I don't intend to be hurtful, but Mary was not sinless. Luke 11, 27 and 28 says this, And it came to pass that as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee. This is a woman saying this to Jesus. Blessed is the womb that bare thee. Blessed is Mary and the paps which thou hast sucked. And Jesus answered that. Jesus said, Yea, but rather, more blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Mary needed to obey the word of God, just like any of us this morning. Your position is not relevant. You can be a pastor, a deacon. You can be the chief trash taker out, or you can be the guy who mows the lawn. Your position doesn't matter. You could be the great-grandson of Lester Roloff. You could be the son of D.L. Moody. You could be the mother of the Wesley brothers. It doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter what your heritage is. It doesn't matter what your family has done. What matters is your obedience. Consider what Isaiah the prophet said about Jesus as we see this taking place in Matthew. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he, this is speaking of Jesus, shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. It says here he shall grow up a plant out of a dry ground. It says he has no form or comeliness. It says he has no beauty. Think about that. But think about that for a second with me this morning, not just in relation to Jesus, but think about it in relation to his family. Sure, we could go way back to Abraham and Ab- or, uh, to David, and David was a king, but that is so distantly removed. I'm sure that Joseph knows it, but nobody says, oh, you're Joseph. You're in the line of King David. Nobody knows who Joseph is. Joseph isn't politically savvy. He doesn't stand in the gates of the city. Jesus isn't growing up in a rich mansion. As far as we can tell, Joseph isn't even famous for being a carpenter. He's just a carpenter providing for his family. Can I put it this way this morning? Until the birth of Jesus, until God moved in the life of this family, this family was what you'd call normal. You'd say run of the mill. You'd say boring. There were people you saw and they just did what they were doing. We know that Jesus was born into this family and we'll look more at that next Sunday. But what about your family this morning? What's your family like? Maybe your family is fancy. Uh, Maybe your family makes living in a cave seem wealthy. Maybe your family is boring. Can I ask this morning, is Jesus in your family? No, he can't be born into your family like Mary and Joseph. But are you praying for your kids? Are you praying for your grandkids to get saved? Are you praying for your kids to marry the right person? Think about it. Consider this. What if Mary would have married, would have married someone else? What if she didn't want to wait for the carpenter and decided to marry a farmer instead? What if Joseph thought that Mary was too plain looking and he wanted someone more exotic? Is Jesus in your family? Is he there when you're playing games? Is he there when you're eating? Is he there when you're driving down the road? We know if you're saved, then literally through the Holy Spirit, he is. But are you acknowledging him? Have you asked God, God, what would you have my family to do for you in 2021? If not, then what is the guiding factor in your family? We're almost to the end. We're going to go a minute or two over. Have you ever had to take a personality or a mental stability test? When I was going out to be a security guard, I had to take one, and it was like, 600 or 1,000 questions. And, you know, this is to make sure that you're not a psychopath or a sociopath because they don't want to arm sociopaths and psychopaths and give them a power position where they can murder people. But many of the questions on it go something like this. A coworker insults you. Do you, A, do nothing? B, tell another coworker. C, tell your boss. D, murder everyone in the office. Hint, it's not D. <laughs> But so many times when it comes to preaching, we know what the right answer is. We know how it should be. And we settle for knowing the right answer instead of living the right answer out in our life. Thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for coming to Sunday school. I know there are some on the internet watching in other states. Thank you for tuning in. Um, And I hope God blesses all of you this morning who took time out of your life to hear what the word of God says. Gracious Heavenly Father God, we just want to thank you, Father, that you are so good to us. We want to thank you that you gave us your son, your only son, your only son that you loved. Lord, please help all those uh, who are listening to your word this morning.
to be able to follow your word, to be able to live your word out, to be able to not just know the right thing, but do it. Father God, please be with us in the next service. Lord, help everything we do to bring honor and glory to you. In your name we pray, amen. Only three minutes over.